And now, I want to introduce our first speaker and the topic he's talking about. iOS Kernel Exploitation Archaeology. A kernel exploit from late uh, 2013, early 2014 will be digged out and analyzed proper archaeology. All the digging, digging and analysis is do done by ArchP here to my left on the stage and uh, give him a big round of applause and the stage is yours. Thanks. Thanks for the introduction. Okay, first of all, thank you all for, for being here. Uh, as the, 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 the person that did the introduction told you, this is going to be an archaeology talk, so I apologize in advance if, if it's not that interesting to you. So we'll talk about a bit older stuff rather than new things. Um, Okay, so a, bit, a few things about myself. Um, actually, I think from all these things, the most important are the, the frag papers, right? So, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, let's, let's ignore all the other stuff. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about. Uh, I'm going to, to talk about the Evasion 7 kernel exploit. Now, Evasion 7 was a jailbreak. It was released by the uh, evaders on the 22nd of December 2013. It supported iOS 7 to iOS 7.1 Beta 3. Uh, that's not the 7.1 stable release, right? So that's a, a beta. Um, and it supported all devices at that time, including the iPhone 5S, which, which was the first 64-bit uh, 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 device, uh, except the Apple TV. Uh, so I decided to reverse engineer the, the kernel exploit of the jailbreak to focus just on that, uh, because I was really interested not not so much in the bug itself, which was, uh, as we will see, uh, not very complicated, but I was really interested to, to understand the, explo the exploitation techniques that the, ev the evaders used. So I, I started reversing it and I, I understanding it, and at some point I, I just said I, I'm, go I'm just going to do a, a re-implementation of the, of the kernel exploit. So this talk is basically my notes on this whole process, and of course it's not a jailbreak walkthrough, right? And I'm going to, to specifically focus on, on the various problems I, I encountered during, during this, uh, this, this task and how I, I overcome them. And hopefully, it's going to give you some help, helpful takeaways uh, for if you do uh, uh, iOS kernel uh, research nowadays. Okay, so uh, the, the general outline is I'm going to say a few things about Evasion 7 to, to set up the, the, the stage, and then I'm going to, to explain the kernel bug itself, and then I'm going to, to talk in length about my debugging setup, and I think that's a very important step that usually uh, phone or embedded uh, uh, talks, uh, exploitation talks, don't, don't uh, analyze that much, and I think it's a really important part. Because usually uh, having a working uh, debugging setup is basically maybe ha half the job of, of doing an, uh, a reliable exploit. Then I'm going to, do ca to, to talk about my implementation of the exploit. And hopefully at the end, we're going to have some, some things to, to take away. Or, or maybe not, we'll, we'll see. OK, so it was the, the version 7 jailbreak was released about four years ago. And that's the, the archaeology in the title. That's, that's ancient history, right? And if you were following the jailbreak community, uh, you might remember this, this huge drama around this jailbreak. Initially, with Jailhot, and if he was planning or not to release it before the evaders, and who he was planning to sell it to, and some leaked discussion uh, that he had with someone that he was offering money to, to buy, and Jehot, he was supposed, his, his jailbreak was supposedly using some of, some of the bugs the evaders were using, so this, this huge drama. And then after the, the version 7 jailbreak released, like maybe a few hours ago, people realized that if your phone had um, uh, a Chinese locale, then the jailbreak was installing um, a, a, a piracy uh, app. Uh, so that was basically a, a third-party uh, app that was taking you to an app store 
not operated by Apple, but by Tyke that had some pirated versions of the, of the real applications on the App Store. And of course, that, that, that also created like a huge drama, uh, this practice. Um, okay, so, so a lot of things were said about that jailbreak at that time and about the Tyke Paris App Store, but what I really set apart was this tweet. And the really important thing uh, that, that I liked about this tweet is that it, it doesn't really make sense. So he says that we have to decide to remotely disable the default installation of Tyke in China for further investigations on the piracy. So, that, that, that whole thing doesn't make sense. So, you, you, you mean you didn't know what was happening? You, you didn't bundle it with a jailbreak? Uh, are you going to disable it for new installations? Or, and then what does remotely then mean exactly? So, what about the people that already had the uh, apps, the, the, the piracy app? Are, how are you going to disable that? Is that what remotely refers to? So, that's, that's an excellent tweet, I think. Um, okay, so... Um, some point after the, the version 7 jailbreak was released, Zeho did a write-up on the user land part of it. So he, he analyzed how the user land part worked, and he stopped at the point of gaining root. Um, and basically, he mentioned, it, he mentioned in his write-up that the version 7 uh, untether binary, which is basically what was doing the kernel exploit, was, was obfuscated. And as we will see, this was, this was uh, indeed the case. And as far as I know, that's the first jailbreak that uh, used uh, deliberate obfuscation. Um, I don't know the reason. I assume it's partly, partly to hide the, the piracy app store that was bundled with it and maybe partly to, to hide the, the, the bug, the kernel bug. Uh, but, but I'm not sure about the reason. Um, now, POSIX Ninja, who uh, found, as far as I know, the, the, bug, the, the kernel bug, uh, did a write-up on the kernel bug. It's on the iPhone wiki. And he basically describes the bug, and he stops at the point uh, where he gets a, a crash log from ZDB. So he doesn't say anything about how, how to exploit it. Um, okay, so after all, all these things uh, happened, then I decided to, to reverse engineer the, the untethered binary and understand the, the exploitation techniques. And I, I was really interested to, to, to reverse engineer the obfuscation that uh, the evaders were using. It seemed like an interesting challenge. And, but as I also mentioned uh, earlier, I, I was really interested to understand the exploitation techniques that they were using. That, that was more important for me at that time. And, um, okay, so the, the, the jailbreak was released uh, December 2013, and I started doing that around February 2014. And I did, did, I did that while, do, while, while having an actual day job, right? So I was spending at most two days per week on that. So what was my, my, my setup? Um, I had an iPhone 4, and... Uh, if you know about iPhone 4s, they have a bootroom, a bootroom bug called LimeRain, which basically has, allows you to, to load arbitrary kernels, unsigned kernels, uh, on the device and run them. And that basically means that you, have, you, you can very easily set up kernel debugging. Uh, so initially, I, I, I had an iPhone 4 device with iOS 7.0.6. Uh, I want to remind you that iPhone 4 is ARM32, right? I also had an iPhone uh, 5S with the same version of iOS. And I, I had that in order to verify all my findings and all my, my tests on, uh, to, to redo my tests on, on an ARM64 device. And as I told you, um, I, the iPhone 5S at that time was the only ARM64 device, actually, I think, on the, on the market. I, I don't think there was another uh, consumer device uh, with ARM64 at that time. So that's uh, the exact version of uh, version 7 I was, I was analyzing. And of course, ZDAT, ZDB, LLDB. Now, the lols in this slide, are, uh, they don't actually uh, refer to something funny. They actually mean something very painful and that caused a lot of like uh, sleepless nights. But I'll, I'll get on to that. OK, a few things about the obfuscation. So uh, not all of the functions of the, of the untethered binary were obfuscated, uh, but some of the important ones were. And those were the ones that were um, uh, triggering the bug, and they were actually doing uh, heap manipulation and, and all, the, all the other important things. 
now, I have been told, I haven't checked that, but I have been told that later versions remove the obfuscation, but I, I'm not sure about that. I haven't, I haven't verified it. And I already had my implementation done at that point, so I wasn't that interested to look at that. So, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, uh, the kernel bug that, uh, uh, that the evasion 7 uh, and tether binary was based on was found by POSIX Ninja. And basically, as far as he says on that uh, iPhone uh, wiki page, he used that six-line uh, bus script fuzzer to, to find it. Uh, so, as you can see, he basically uh, creates device nodes and with, with, um, uh, with controlled uh, arguments here, like uh, minor and major uh, numbers. Now, in order to, to get to the point to create uh, device nodes, uh, you, you basically need to be outside of the, of the application sandbox uh, that exists on iOS, and you also need root privileges. And uh, that's, that's what I refer to as the user land part of the version 7 binary, and I'm, I'm not going to cover that at all. So um, I'm going to start my analysis from the point on that uh, we have escaped the sandbox, we have obtained root, and now we, we, we go to, to exploit the kernel bug. Now, uh, that's, that's code from that uh, version of the XNU uh, kernel that, that had the bug. Now, this PTSD open function is called every time um, uh, userland code opens a, a dev PTMX device. And then this PTMX get IOCTL function is called. Now, the important thing here is that dev here is completely user controlled, and then it's passed to this PTMX get IOCTL function with no checks at all, right? And then this PTMX get IOCTL function uses this to index an array without any checks. So basically, the bug is an invalid indexing bug, right? So she, since you can control that, you can put here whatever. Uh, I have here the PTMX IOCTL struct. Uh, that, uh, oh, okay, this array here is, uh, so this state uh, struct here is global to the kernel, and this piece IOCTL list um, array here is uh, on the kernel heap, and it is a, an array of PTMX IOCTL structs, and that's the PTMX IOCTL struct, and th uh, the important thing here is uh, that I'm going to refer to again and again during the talk is that it has a pointer to a TTY struct uh, as the first element of the, of the structure. Okay, so, so we control the, the, the index uh, to the array. So what can we do with that? So um, here, as you can see, it return, uh, PTMX, the PTMX get IOCTL function returns whatever, whatever it indexes, right? So, as you can see here, it, it, it assigns it to this PTI variable and then does all, all kinds of interesting things. So, PTI is controllable. Uh, TP is controllable here as well after this dereference here to some controllable value. And, um, I mean, in other code paths of the kernel, this is, uh, this is called again. And so, so there, are, there are a lot of things to, 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 to consider when, when you, you, you know the bug and then you try to think how to exploit it. Um, okay, one important thing here that I wanted to mention is that uh, this PTMX, um, uh, this function here, PTMX get IOCTL, uh, also does a, an alloc the, uh, the allocation of this um, struct here, of this TTY uh, struct here. And that's important because I'm going to, to use it uh, further on. Okay, another important thing is that uh, you basically, this bug, what allows you to do is you can control the size of this array here. So by, uh, can you see that? Okay, so by repeatedly open the dev PTMX device, uh, you can grow this array. Uh, and you can grow it, as you see here, by this grow, grow vector. That's, that's 16, but it doesn't matter. What, what matters is that, the, the, the size of this array uh, in bytes is controllable by, by you, the, 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 uh, the person who, who are trying to exploit this bug. Now, uh, 
for, for example, uh, these are nodes from my from my exploit. So if I if I did one allocation, if I if I did one open of this uh, dev PTMX device, then this array uh, was going into calloc 64. If I was doing 17, it was going to calloc uh, one, uh, 128. If I was doing 33 opens here, it was going to calloc 192, and so on and so forth. So I could. I could decide in which calloc zone I could place the, the array. Uh, if you don't know calloc zones, they're basically, uh, you can think them as a container, you can think calloc zones as containers for heap objects on the kernel heap. All of them can be of different type, but uh, they're all, all of them are uh, of the same size, right? So calloc 64 can have different structures of size 64 bytes. Uh, but, but all of them are, are size 64 bytes. Okay, so I, I started debugging the, the untether binary in userland. Uh, that, that's how I started. So initially I, use, I was using GDB, and I found out that nothing worked with GDB. It was, at that point, Apple was uh, starting to move from GDB to LLDB. So I don't know, maybe, maybe that was the reason GDB wasn't tested, sim it wasn't tested at all. So when I say nothing worked, I mean that I was placing breakpoints and they weren't hitting. And um, I was trying like stepping and it was continuing execution and stuff like that. Sometimes it, I couldn't even attach to the binary. Um, so then I moved to LLDB to an LLDB setup with the back server and things were uh, much better. Now. While I was experimenting still from, from just with userland debugging, um, my, my iPhone 4 device went to, into a recovery loop and I wasn't able to, to get out of it. So uh, I was forced to, to do a, a, a clean um, uh, restore of the device. Uh, the problem was that at that time, only iOS 7.1 was signed by Apple. So I couldn't install a version of iOS that had the kernel that had the bug that I was interested to, to look at. But on the other hand, I couldn't not restore my device because that was the only vice, device I had at the point that I, I, I could do kernel debugging with. So I, I upgraded my device to 7.1. Uh, as, as I just told you, 7.1 uh, didn't have a, a vulnerable kernel to, that, to this bug. Uh, so. What I wanted to do was basically to boot an uh, iOS 7.1 device with a 7.0.6 kernel. And in order to do that, I, I could use the lime, the lime rain bug that allowed me to boot arbitrary kernels. And the utility to do that was Red Snow, right? The problem was that Red Snow um, only supported up to iOS uh, 6. Uh, and it, wasn't, it didn't have support for, for iOS 7. So I, I left all the other things I was doing, and I started reversing Red Snow to understand how it worked. Red Snow, uh, if you don't know, it's, uh, it was back then, and it still is closed source, right? So I, I started reversing that to understand how it worked in order to support, to, for me to hot pad, to, to, to patch it, to binary patch it to add support for iOS 7. And I spent, like, I don't know, maybe a month on that, and then I realized that it was it wasn't leading me anywhere. I, I couldn't understand a lot of things about how Red Snow was implemented. So I, I stopped doing that. And at that point, I, I found Open Snow, which uh, was um, an effort by Windows CM to re-implement Red Snow as open source. So it seemed to have support for iOS 7, and that was good. Uh, I tested that, and it was it was working. Now my problem was that. Um, uh, I couldn't have arbitrary, an arbitrary length of boot arcs. Boot arcs are the, the arguments that you pass to the kernel when it boots. And they are really important in iOS because by passing certain boot arcs uh, to the kernel, you can disable uh, 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 signing checks. You can uh, uh, enable kernel debugging. So it's really important to be able to pass arbitrary length boot arcs. And, um, iOS 7.1 was using up to 39 characters, so that was uh, the reason OpenSnow couldn't support more. So what I ended up doing was I, I patched IBEC, uh, which is basically the, the, the loader of the, of the kernel, right, that passes boot arcs to the kernel when it boots. And basically I, I, I changed the, the pointer to the boot arcs to some other place that, uh, that had much more space. So at that point, I, I was able to pass arbitrary length boot arcs to my kernel. So 
where we are at last. So I had an, uh, an iPhone 4 device with iOS 7.1, and I was uh, using OpenSnow to boot uh, the 7.0.6 kernel uh, that had the bug that I was interested to, to exploit. Now, one, uh, one side note here is that uh, as I was doing that and I was trying to to add to open, to open snow all the patches to the kernel to enable kernel debugging, I, I was reversing uh, the evasion 7 binary as well. Now, the evasion 7 binary was trying also to, after it, it exploited the kernel, it was patching it to enable kernel debugging. But uh, so I was just copying their patches, right, and adding them to open snow. But uh, I realized at some point that they missed some, uh, some check off for the debug enabled variable and KDP wasn't really working. So uh, the session was, was established and it seemed like it was working, but if you try to actually use the, the, kernel, uh, the KDB, the kernel debugging setup for, to, to, to do actual, like to attach the debugger to the kernel and do whatever, like place a breakpoint or, or step, uh, then KDB just froze. So I added uh, uh, another, another path that was required on that. Um, okay, so kernel debugging at last, but that's, that's not really what happened because, you know, uh, breakpoints didn't always work. So you were placing a breakpoint and it, it, it wasn't hitting uh, when execution was reaching there. And you were trying to step instructions and uh, the execution just continues. So we're you were stepping one instruction, it was just like you were typing continue. And if you, you were taking too long to type uh, uh, an LLDB command, then KDB froze. And then you had to restart your device, reestablish the kernel debugging uh, session, and, con and, and start from zero. And if you issue commands too fast, then KDB froze again. So you have to reboot again. It was amazing. It was a great time. And um, now I did similar stuff with iOS 6. And I, I, I distinctly remember that it was much easier and kernel debugging worked much better. And uh, I mean, the, the issue that comes uh, to everyone's mind that does that is, do Apple engineers really use KDB for, for debugging the iOS kernel, or, or do they use something else? OK, so now I could uh, debug the evasion several tether binary both from the user, from the user land side and from the kernel side. And that was good, because I was uh, analyzing at, rat at runtime and uh, at the same time, I was uh, uh, reversing it in NIDA, so the, the obfuscation, uh, I, could, I could do it much faster since I was, I was taking hits from runtime. Um, so I, I, at that point, uh, things started moving fast, and I quickly found that it was abusing the DTY structure uh, to obtain read-write uh, read access to physical memory. I mean, that, that's, that's, that was interesting to me, but I was expecting something else. I was, I was expecting something like what they did in uh, iOS, uh, in the version 6 uh, jailbreak, that they did like a lot of heap manipulation, and that, 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 that's my interest, actually, heap exploitation. So at that point, I decided to stop reversing it and re-implement the exploit the way that I, I wanted to do it. So obviously, that, that, that wasn't work from scratch. It was from everything that I understood up to that point. And what I really wanted to use was the VMAP copy uh, structures technique by Dowd and Mant. And I'm going to explain that uh, in the following slides, how, how it works. Uh, OK, so at that point, I had a, a clear understanding of the bug, of what it was. And I had a general idea like about how to exploit it. And I mean, if you've done that, you know, then it, it takes a lot of pen and paper, like ideas you, you develop on paper, then you go test them, and they don't work, and then you design them again, and then again, and, and you fail, and you despair, and then you suddenly have an idea, and you spend like, I don't know, like two nights, uh, you stay up until five in the morning, uh, testing things, and they don't work, and then you despair again, and ad nauseum. But eventually, you get somewhere. So let's, let's talk about exploitation now. Um, now, uh, a few things to, to refresh your memory about the bug. So as I said, it was an invalid indexing bug. This PCIOCTL list array was on the heap. And I could control in which calloc zone it, it can go. I can grow it. But once I grow it, I cannot shrink it back. Um, 
Now, uh, that's, that's code from that PTMX get IOCTL uh, function. So what basically what it does, it allocates a new PTMX IOCTL structure, and then it uses the index that you provide, uh, that you control to store uh, the address on, on the array. Now, this allocation here, this struct here, goes into calloc 88. And that's, that's useful for, for the next parts. OK, a few things about the technique I wanted to use, uh, about the exploitation technique I wanted to use. So it's the VMAP copy technique. It was proposed by Dowd and Mudd. And uh, basically, they were spraying the heap with these structs here, the VMAP copy structs. And assuming you have like um, some way to corrupt this struct that you have sprayed on the heap, uh, if you can uh, override this Kate data element here, then basically what you have is uh, a leak of kernel memory, either adjacent, like next to the Kate data, whatever is uh, below or above the Kate data pointer, or arbitrary if you put whatever address you want in there. By, by overwriting the calloc size uh, element here uh, and then freeing the, the struct on the heap, you put it on a, wrong zone, on a wrong zone and basically when you allocate it back, since you put it on a, on a different sized uh, zone, you can, you can have a heap overflow. So that's, that's a general overview of this technique. So but you corrupt this struct and you get primitive, exploitation primitives. Uh, okay, so what, what was the idea uh, I had at that point? The idea was to use the, uh, this PCIOCTL list index bug to corrupt this K data pointer here and to have arbitrarily, uh, sorry, to have uh, uh, a, relative, a relative leak of, of kernel uh, heap memory. And that would, would be my, my first step towards exploiting the bug. Of course, the end goal is to have arbitrary uh, read write, right? And of course, it was just a fuzzy idea at that point, and you know, that's always the goal. But uh, when you study the bug and you see the different code paths and how the, the, the things you, you affect uh, are used, uh, then you have some maybe not completely concrete things in your mind, but you know that interesting things can happen. So that, that's what I had at that point. OK, so let's, let's talk about the exploitation stages now. Um, so at stage one, I sprayed the, the kernel heap with VMAP copy structs. And uh, I decided to, to work on the calloc 256 zone. And the reason for that was completely arbitrary was because uh, of all the kernel debugging I have done up to this point of this untether binary, I saw that this calloc zone was, was not really used that much, either by the kernel or by whatever the, the exploit was doing. So that's, that's good because it means that uh, uh, you, can, you as an exploiter can have much, much better control over the kernel heap if there aren't, aren't thing, other things uh, placing uh, allocations on the, on the zone you, you work. Uh, so I decided to use the calloc to 5.6 zone. Um, I, I avoided, of course, calloc 3.8.4 because the TTY structs were going there, and that would really mess up my, my heap um, uh, arrangements. Uh, so the first, uh, l let me actually. Um, okay, so what, what I wanted to do was to do this. So. Uh, Initially, you spray the heap with VMAP copy structs, and you control both their size and their contents. The contents don't matter at this point, so it, just their size matters. So uh, I spray with 256 bytes VMAP copy structs, and then I free every other second one, and I create this kind of pattern, like a VMAP copy and a free slot, and VMAP copy and a free slot. And then I, I grow the PSIOCTL list um, array, uh, to 256 bytes, and then it goes into one of these free slots here. Uh, now, the code uh, for, for doing that looks something like that. So what this basically does is sends, uh, uh, it creates this, uh, uh, so if you see here, the out of line um, uh, MAC messages as basically these VMAP copy structs. And, um, uh, their size is 256, their buffer doesn't matter at this point, and you just send them, like, mach send message. 
And then after you, I have sprayed with them, then you, you free every, every second one here with this loop here. So in order to make these free slots, you just receive uh, this uh, uh, Mac uh, out of line messages that correspond to the VMAP copy structs. And uh, after you've created the holes, you basically grow the array to 256 bytes. How do you do that? As I mentioned earlier, you open the DevPTMX uh, uh, device a number of times. How many times? It doesn't matter. Like a specific number of times that I, I mentioned earlier uh, that I have noticed uh, grows it to 256 bytes. So that's, that's the arrangement you have at that, at that first stage. OK, so the second stage. Uh, is, is done on, calocate, on the calloc 88 zone. Uh, so I spray again with VMAP copy structs, and this time uh, I make them 88 bytes to go to the calloc 88 zone, and then I create again holes. And then I, I trigger the bug with an uh, invalid index value, and remember that when you trigger the bug, a PTMX IOCTL struct is allocated. And this goes to calloc 88. But because on calloc 88, I have created this pattern of uh, used, free, used, free, it goes into a, one of the free slots. So now I have a PTMX IOCTL struct in one, into one of my free slots. Uh, I, don't know, I don't know where that is, but I know that it falls into the pattern, right? So I trigger the bug, and... Uh, Remember that uh, basically you control this index, right? So uh, since I control the index, I point it to the VMAP, to the K data element of the VMAP copy struct that I know is below the, the, the free slot that the array went into. I don't know the address, right? I can put like a, a, an address there, but I, can, I, I know the, the, relative, uh, the relative distance in bytes because I created the, the pattern. The, the, the heap pattern. So uh, let's go to, OK, so it looks like that. So that's my first stage, right? Free VMAP copy. And this is the same pattern on the calloc 88 zone. When you trigger the bug, this PTMX IOCTL structure is allocated. It goes into one of the free slots, right? And then the, the, the bug itself, which is what we see here is, remember, you control the index. So this is the new allocation that went here. And then it goes and stores the ad this address where the index tells it to store, to store it. But remember that this is controlled. We control that. So what I do, I point this here relatively to the, to the neighboring VMAP copy struct at the K data field, right? So in this K data field here of the VMAP copy struct, I have now this address, right? So that's, that's, the, uh, that's how the heap looks like. Uh, I have here the code. It's very similar to the first stage. Right? You spray with, uh, eight, uh, with VMAP copy structs of size um, 88, max and message, right? And then you receive every second one. You create the, um, uh, the holes on the 88 zone. And uh, then you trigger the bug here, right? This invalid this index um, uh, number uh, here is basically what points relatively to here, right? Uh, so I have now the, the address of this PTMX, PTMX IOCTL uh, struct, which is an address on the calloc 88 zone. I have it on the gate data, on the gate data field of this VMAP copy struct here. So what I do, I can simply receive this message and uh, in, its, in its content, I can see the address of, the, of that slot on the calloc 88 zone. So that's, that's the code to do that. Uh, I simply receive uh, all, the, all the messages, and um, that's, that's my address. OK, so at, at this point, I only, what I only have is this address here, right? I have the address of this heap slot. So uh, at that point, I started looking at other code paths that uh, uh, this invalid index, uh, uh, what other variables this invalid index were, were, was influencing. And 
I found a code path that was actually were giving, was giving me a write. And, but in order to reach, that, to reach that, I needed to survive several dereferences. And what I only knew was just the calloc 88 address, right? Nothing else. So I will now walk you through everything that, that gave me this, uh, this write. Um, so I clean up the calloc 256 zone, and I spray it again with VMAP copy structs and create holes, exactly like the previous uh, uh, step, uh, the first stage. Uh, again, next to the PSC IOCTL list uh, uh, array, I have a VMAP copy struct. But th this time, I, in all the, the VM VMAP copy structs, I put a payload of, the, of this uh, fake PTMX IOCTL address I have. Uh, and remember that the first element of the PTMX IOCTL struct is a, is a pointer to a TTY struct. And I can, use, uh, I, can, I can use the leaked address I have for, for this pointer that I, I, don't know, uh, I didn't know where to point it to. So the next step was to clean up the calloc 88 zone and spray it again. And uh, again, I spray it with VMAP copy structs. But at this time, at the payload, I, I, I can put now the fake uh, TTY struct that the, P, that the PTMX IOCTL struct is pointing to. Uh, the problem at that point was that um, uh, the TTY struct was 256 bytes, and calloc 88 has uh, the slots are only 88 bytes. So I couldn't uh, just with the elements of the just with the first 88 byte uh, elements, I couldn't get to the path uh, that was giving the write. Uh, so I needed to find some other way to. Um, uh, to host my, my fake TTY struct. Um, so remember that I couldn't work on any other uh, calloc zone or anywhere else, because what I only knew was the, the address of that calloc 88 zone. I, I had nothing else to build on. So uh, at that point, I, I, I started doing a much more um, uh, a much more complicated heap arrangement. So instead of spraying just one thing, I was spraying, um, I was trying to create a pattern of uh, uh, a pattern of two controlled things. Now I couldn't use VMAP copy structs for both these slots because the VMAP copy structs has a header, right? So it would mess up my my fake TTY struct. So uh, by reading Ionic's uh, kernel uh, heap uh, exploitation slides, I, I, I realized that I could spray the heap with uh, uh, XML properties of length 88 from that Apple JPEG driver. And uh, I, could, I could place as a second control object after the VMAP copy struct this, uh, this XML properties, which are completely controlled in, in, uh, in uh, content. And I could host the second part of the TTY struct there. I mean, it's still not 256 bytes, but what it gives me is uh, 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 the ability to survive all the references to reach the, the ride that I was interested in. Uh, OK, so a few things about the, the TTY struct. So that's, that's uh, what I, want, I, I wanted to create on the calloc 88 zone, right? So that's the, the TTY struct that the PTMX IOCTL struct is pointing to. Now, um, what, what basically I wanted to do here is uh, I wanted to, um, to point, the final thing was to, to use this C list uh, struct uh, to control this element here, C underscore CS, uh, as the start of the ring buffer for the TTY to, to give me an arbitrary write. Uh, sorry, to give me a controlled write. Uh, I started playing a bit with to use it to do arbitrary uh, write, but I found that uh, I wasn't able to do it because at a later stage, uh, um, some other parts of the TTY struct were needed that I wasn't able to control, so I only had two uh, 88 uh, uh, slots to host my fake TTY struct. So that wasn't stable. So I, only, I was only using that to do a, a relative uh, write. So uh, we'll, we'll see the code later on. Let's go to the, to the heap layout. So that's, that's the, the, the third stage. 
Uh, again, remember, I spread the CALOG 256 zone with VMAP copy structs, freeze, just to place my PCIOCTL uh, list array next to a VMAP copy struct. Remember that I control the contents of VMAP copy, right? So I placed in the buffer of uh, VMAP copy uh, this PTM PTMXIOCTL uh, address that I know, and I point the invalid index that I control to this PTMXIOCTL uh, this, this address that I put here. And what is this address? Is that leaked address that I got in the previous stage, which points to, uh, to the CALOC 88 zone. And what's the arrangement on that CALOC 88 zone? Is as I told you, a VMAP copy followed by an XML uh, properties. VMAP copy, XML properties. And, and all these host this fake TTY strikes, right? All these are the same. I just uh, explained here how it looks like. So uh, this points to the K data element uh, here, and the rest of it holds the rest of the. Uh, all this is basically the, the fake TTY track, like the the buffer of the VMAP copy, and then following the the XML contents of of this uh, heap allocation. And where do I p this C underscore CS pointer that I told you that I that I wanted to control? Where do I point it? I point it relatively, again, I don't know any addresses, but I can point it relatively since I know the, the since I created the, this uh, heap arrangement, I can point it relatively to uh, the size or the calloc size of the neighboring VMAP copy struct. And why do I need this? Because I want to, to use the VMAP copy uh, technique uh, by Mark and Dodd that I, that I mentioned earlier. So that's, that's, that's the, end, the end goal. So what the code looks like? Okay, that's the spray of 256. We have seen that a lot of times. Then we have the, the freeze. Uh, wait, no, that's not the freeze. Uh, so that's the allocations of the 256. That's, yeah, I, I don't have the freeze here because they don't matter because we have seen them before. So what I have here is the spray of the CALOC 88 zone. And the important thing here is that what I wanted to show you is that, is that at every step, I took two allocations. One is the VMAP copy struct here, the VMAP copy struct here with the max send message. And the second part is the XML properties, uh, which uh, are sprayed on the heap when you uh, open the, um, uh, the device uh, driver, the Apple JBEC driver. And what, what are the contents of that XML uh, properties? They're basically that uh, fake the second part of the fake TTY struct that have the controlled C underscore CS pointer that will give me the relative right. So uh, if you see here, I have this uh, function set up fake TTY that basically creates the structs since I don't have to type all the time. And uh, we are at the second stage here. And basically what you can see here is the creation of the, of the fake TTY struct, right? So that's the different elements of the fake TTY as we saw it from the code. And that's, that's the right offset I wanted to, that I pointed to the, to, to the K data field of the neighboring VMAP copy struct. So again, that's, that's, that's how it looks like in, in the heap. Okay, so after that, after we have arranged, uh, the, I have, we have arranged it this way, we, we trigger again the invalid in index array bug, but at this time on a slave PTMX device. I was only doing that on a, on, a, on a master PTMX device, but in order to reach that right code path that I mentioned, you, you need to do it on a slave PTMX device. So that's, that's what happens here. And then you simply write to the corresponding descriptor, and it just dereferences this C underscore CS that you controlled. And, you, and, and it, it writes to it whatever you, you want to write. And what do I want to write? I want to write a new size for the VMAP copy struct uh, for, for the calloc size field of the, v, of the neighboring VMAP copy struct so I can, I can use the uh, doubt and uh, mad technique. So uh, putting everything together, uh, so at that point, I have a controlled corruption of a VMAP copy struct. And I can use the, the primitives to get arbitrary, uh, an arbitrary leak. So I can, uh, I can leak, for example, the, the KSLR slide. And I can do a heap overflow. Uh, again, these are how, how you can use the primitives that um, Mark and Doubt gave us. Uh, now, uh, I also know my, my location on the kernel heap. And remember, that's, that's basically 
we found that on the state on the first on the first two stages, and we only we use only that like where that uh, uh, PTMX IOCTL struct was uh, was stored on the kernel heap. That's the only thing we knew that address in order to to successively build on it in order to to reach uh, like a, a much more useful primitive. And the, import, the, the interesting thing here is that everything up to this point is data only, right? So you haven't injected any code, you haven't done anything at all uh, that, that you could be caught somehow by, by a kernel self-protection mechanism or all these kind of things. Everything is data only. Um, so once you reach that point, how, how do you get PC control? So uh, since, since you can use... Uh, uh, ma uh, uh, doubts and months technique, you can basically uh, do a heap overflow. So you can again do a, a heap arrangement, you can place IOKit objects next to, to VMAP copy structs where you can overflow from, and you can uh, corrupt IOKit objects. And from there, you can have uh, also you can do a, a, an arbitrary write, read, right? Uh, right. So you can by the arbitrary read, you can uh, read the, um, the V table of the IOKit object so you know the KSLR slide and you can corrupt it in order to, to get PC control. Um, and of course, getting to, to, to a whole JBLIC from that point uh, is, is out of the scope of the stock, and, but, but it's not that hard actually from that point on. Uh, okay, so after doing all that, uh, how close uh, was that, that exploit to to the evasion, to the real evasion uh, seven uh, kernel exploit, I'd say it was pretty far off. But uh, I mean, it wasn't my point to recreate it like completely, but it was my point to to play with the heap and to try to do complex heap arrangements and to see how much I understand the the, the iOS kernel heap. Th that was the point of, of this whole exercise for me. Okay, so some lessons learned. So uh, the, the real surprising thing for me uh, at that point was that I couldn't believe that Apple uh, does kernel debugging via KDP. Uh, it was very flaky, it was very unstable. Uh, as I told you, if you type commands too fast, it froze. If you type commands very slow, it had like a, a watchdog timer and it froze, I think. It had a watchdog timer or something like that. And it's unbe it's, I, I couldn't believe that Apple engineers were, were using this, this interface to do kernel debugging. So it was, it was really hard to do anything on the kernel side of, of, of i devices. Um, but of course, I, I don't really mean that you shouldn't, you shouldn't mess with these things, right? Uh, I mean, these devices are really interesting. And it's, it's really becoming harder to hack them, but I think it's much more fun. And I think the only takeaway maybe is that you shouldn't report bugs to Apple at all. And if you need street cred, you should just report white elephant bugs to them. I mean, that's, that's always good. And I mean, this, very, this, is, this is getting very esoteric, right? There are no, not a lot of information, and Apple keeps changing stuff, and everything is closed source. I mean, all the important parts are closed source. And I mean, I really, th I really think people that work on that thing should uh, share notes uh, as much as possible. Okay, so s these are some of the people I was talking to while doing all this, and I want to mention them. And basically, that's that's all of the material I have, and I'm I'm open to to any questions you might have. Thank you, Art P, for the talk. So we have prepared microphones one, two, three, and four uh, in the room. And uh, we have a um, signal angel, I think. You, uh, when you have uh, questions, you can uh, give, me a, uh, give me a hand sign. But uh, I think we start with microphone two here in the front. And please ask questions. and. No comments, there's time after the talk. Okay, go ahead. Thanks for your awesome talk. Thanks. Uh, I have a question about uh, heap sprain. Uh, was your heap sprain really stable? Uh, if it is not successful, did it crush the device? 
Yeah, so um, I haven't mentioned it here, but it was pretty stable. I think it was something like, because I did a lot of tests for that, because it was really interesting uh, for me to know. It was maybe something like 90%. Uh, so nine, 9 out of 10 times it worked, but if it didn't work, yeah, the, yes, it crashed the kernel and crashed the device, yeah. Uh, and did you try to return heap into some kind of initial state to start your exploit from scratch? Yeah, that's, that's true. I haven't included that, but uh, you're, you're right. So the initial step on every spray that I mentioned here was to spray a lot of uh, objects of, of uh, the specific size you, you were targeting in order to get basically a new page of the calloc zone, right? So you, you, so even if, uh, as I told you, the calloc 256 zone wasn't that busy, it's still, there were still allocations going on it, right? So if you did a lot of uh, initial spraying, you were making sure that when your, uh, the allocations that mattered uh, to you were, were made, were on a new page that weren't, wasn't too much noise from other allocations from the kernel. So yeah, you're right. I haven't included that, but yeah, that happened. Thanks, okay. great. Thanks. Uh, then um, microphone one, please. Um, also, thank you for your awesome talk again. Thanks. Um, my question was, nowadays it's way harder to use VM copy. I think Apple truly deprecated it. Yeah. It's not possible anymore to, no. due to security. Um, do you see hope in reconstructing some function that does the same, or is it totally dead now? Oh, oh you mean the, the VM app copy technique? Yes. No, I think it's completely dead now. All right. And I recently saw on the iOS logs uh, of vulnerabilities that again um, vul vulnerability in Apple JPEG driver was found. And do you think? Have you looked into it? Or well, Apple, Apple, the Apple JPEG driver is one of the four, I think, IOKit drivers that you can reach from the container uh, sandbox, right? So, so it's that that okay. means it's very, very fast by everyone, Apple included, and very audited. So I'm not saying that there aren't many, there aren't things there, like interesting findings, <laughs> okay. but if there are, they're, they're not going to live much longer, I think. Okay, thank you. Thanks for your question. And now from the Signal Angel, a uh, question from the internet. Yes, I have a question from the internet. How long did this research take you? You said two weeks in the beginning, but from begin to end, how many hours about? Because you also said it was during work. No, no, it didn't, it didn't take two weeks, no. It took like maybe close to three months, so two months and something like that. So I spent, uh, as, as I mentioned, I spent like a complete month, I think, like maybe three weeks, maybe not a complete month, just on reversing red snow and trying to, to get red, red, red snow to play with iOS 7. So I wouldn't count this month in the, in the exploit part of it, right? So if, you, if you're interested just in the kernel uh, exploit part, I would say something like... Uh, Maybe uh, seven weeks, something like that. But, but just with two, two, maybe three days per, per week, right? Not, not complete weeks. Okay, then uh, microphone one, please. Um, congratulations, your talk. It was really interesting. I liked it a lot. And my question is, if the technique you use it to exploit the bug, it works in FreeBSD or any other BSD as well? Oh, no, no. Uh, I mean, the VMAP, Copy struct doesn't exist anywhere else except uh, uh, the XNU kernel. Uh, but uh, I think the interesting takeaway is that you can do complex heap arrangements if you understand the, the kernel heap allocator, right? So this, this, uh, uh, this process I, I described by creating holes and maybe controlling two allocations in order to host fake structures that you are able then uh, to use to get uh, exploitation primitives, then that's applicable everywhere, right? Thank you. Okay, then we go to microphone two again, please. So I saw uh, one sentence, just not uh, report, or just don't report the bugs. Um, I would like to understand your thinking behind, because I think this is really important for companies to know uh, the bugs that they made and, uh, yeah, make the products better. And this is really beneficial for a researcher because, uh, for example, Apple, they pay a lot of money for the bugs. But Okay, yeah, I don't have much to say, to say on that. I mean, apart from if, if all the bugs are fixed, then you won't be able to do this kind of work, and it, it's no fun. So <laughs> I don't have anything else to say on that. 
sorry, I, yeah, <laughs> I don't feel anything else. <laughs> no comment. Okay, uh, Signal Angel, do we have another question from the internet? Okay, then please a big round of applause for our speaker. Thanks. Thanks.